Paul Faulkner's Paul Faulkner says, um, the idea that conversation be seen as a cooperative endeavor yields a pair of social norms. The prescription that speakers follow the cooperative principle and its maxims describes a social norm of trustworthiness and the paired prescription that as audiences, we presume this of speakers and act as if we believe that they are following the cooperative principle and its maxims describes a social norm of trust. I take this pair of norms to describe our conversational practices. So, So um, I think that what we see here is I think a pretty powerful instance of um, what we might call ideal epistemology. So, you know, Charles Mills, you know, I think like very, um, you know, I, I think in a, in, a, in a very kind of gripping sort of way characterizes ideal theory um, as being, you know, kind of distinguished by its reliance on idealization to the exclusion or at least to the marginalization of the actual. Ideal theory either tacitly represents the actual as a simple deviation from the ideal, not worth theorizing in its own right, or claims that starting from the ideal is at least the best way of realizing it. And so Mill says that ideal theory will use some or all of a list of concepts and assumptions, including idealized capacities, ideal social institutions, and silence on oppression. So I think that um, you know, ideal theory, you know, again, is the, you know, the, the one of the, you know, he says the distinguishing feature is its reliance on idealization to the exclusion of the actual world. And I think what we see in, in these you know, kind of classic views of the epistemology of testimony is that the theoretical starting point of these views is a testimonial exchange of complete cooperation where um, are the, you know, the people testifying are those who can be trusted and the speakers themselves are trustworthy. And just as Mills argues that ideal theory represents the actual as a simple deviation from the ideal, these theorists, and this is just dominates the epistemology of testimony. I mean, I didn't want to bore you with screen after screen of, of slides, but um, you, know, you can just take my word for it, um, that um, the, the epistemology of testimony literature for, for the last several decades has just been dominated by this defeating conditions, you know, kind of, um, move that kind of relegates to defeating conditions, the massive and multitude of ways in which things can go awry in testimonial exchanges. And I think we see that in those, uh, I think, representative quotations. And so those defeating conditions, as Mill says, um, are not theorized in their own right. They're really just like, here's, you know, kind of the ideal starting point, cooperative conversation. You know, I trust what I'm told and I am trustworthy. And anything that deviates from that, we just say defeating conditions. And, you know, epistemologists working on testimony just say very, very little about those defeating conditions. Um, so ideal, you know, kind of, again, referring back to Charles's work, um, ideal epistemology of testimony, we see idealized capacities, speakers are trustworthy, and hearers are trusting. We see ideal social institutions, conversations are cooperative activities. And we see silence on oppression, the social identity of speakers and hearers and the biases they face are ignored. So um, I think that what I want to do today um, is um, just kind of you know, a very, very small move towards shifting to non-ideal epistemology of, to, to a non-ideal approach to the epistemology of testimony. And what I want to suggest is that um, if we begin with the complexity of real life conversations, and let me just highlight, I'm gonna be talking about like maybe th roughly three features of the complexity of real life conversations. There are many, many, many other features that I won't say anything at all about today. But if we begin with the complexity of real life conversations, I think that we see that the starting place of many epistemologists in um, you know, kind of, uh, of, of testimony, um, we see that that starting place is um, it's just is deeply misguided. So um, I'm going to engage in non-ideal epistemology of testimony, beginning with a common criticism of much online and political discourse, namely that people are in echo chambers. I'm going to suggest that echo chambers by themselves are not epistemically problematic, and this is going to be crucial to our discussion of non-ideal epistemology, because I think that many of the traditional analyses of what makes echo chambers problematic really does represent kind of, again, a form of idealization and um, looking at echo chambers as being something that can be theorized in a purely sort of structural way. 
But I think that um, the problem, in fact, for echo chambers is much better explained by looking at the at, at the difference between fake and real news um, or false and you know kind of true um, testimony. Um, and then I'm going to suggest that the prevalence of social media bots poses, I think, a unique set of epistemic problems, particularly for ideal epistemology of testimony. And I'm going to conclude by suggesting that we need to radically rethink uh, much work in the epistemology of testimony. Um, so um, I'm sorry, Robin, can you just tell me what time I should stop talking? If Robin's there. Okay, so if you could, I guess, aim for uh, about, uh, wait, that would be quarter to 11 your time. You want uh, me to 40. be done at quarter to? Well, okay, okay. aim for, but obviously if you go five, 10 minutes over that, then I mean, it just okay. cuts into the time of the Q&A, so. Um, okay, okay, I I'll, I'll get going because I have a lot to get through. Um, so I'll try, I'm gonna talk super fast. I might skip some slides. Um, so I think that, um, you know, we, this is just a kind of a, a paradigmatic case while Trump was president, um, he caught his wife Melania watching um, CNN on Air Force One. And the solution that they proposed was that Trump staff um, kind of confirmed that moving forward, it would be standard operating procedure to have all TVs turned to Fox. Um, and the common criticism we saw across the board was that Trump and his supporters are in an echo chamber. Um, there are three central features that we see in echo chambers. There's an opinion that is repeated and reinforced, thereby amplifying it, often through resharing. It occurs in an enclosed system or chamber, such as a social network, allowing that opinion to echo. And dissenting voices are either absent or drowned out. These are just some representative quotations of um, kind of that capture those three elements. I'm going to skip them in the interest of, of time. Now, echo chambers are not a value neutral claim. It's a criticism or a call for change, um, particularly from an epistemic point of view. When someone says, um, you know, Trump is in an echo chamber and that's the headline, we're not supposed to interpret that as then calling for a further question. Well, is it a good echo chamber or a bad echo chamber? It's a normative claim. And, but, but surprisingly, I mean, in, in common conversations of echo chambers, there's actually like surprisingly little diagnosis of what the actual problem is. So um, I think one of the standard um, problems that's regard, you know, that, that um, people take to be operative is that there's a problematic level of dependence. Um, so there's, you know, when, when there's an echo chamber, um, there's an absence of sufficient independence among the views being expressed, but there's also a lack of awareness regarding this absence, right? So when you see like a whole bunch of people saying, you know, that P, um, there's like, wow, so many people believe that P, but when you're in an echo chamber, there's a real lack of, of independence, even though there's this kind of massive number of voices and people are aware of that lack, uh, unaware of that um, lack of independence. Um, you know, Wittgenstein has that really well-known newspaper example that if you read 50 copies of the New York Times, you know, it doesn't increase um, the epistemic status of your beliefs. Um, and I think that this criticism of echo chambers is really familiar from the epistemology of disagreement. Um, so, you know, it's very commonly assumed, you know, here's Thomas Kelly, even in cases in which opinion is sharply divided among a large number of generally reliable individuals, it would be a mistake to be impressed by the sheer number of such individuals on both sides of the issue, for numbers mean little in the absence of independence. And similarly, Adam Elga says, an additional outside opinion should move one only to the extent that one counts it as independent from a opinions one has already taken into account. Such a thesis, Elga claims, is completely uncontroversial and every sensible view on disagreement should accommodate it. So I think, um, you know, kind of there's this, there's this, you know, obviously, you know, you see what Elga says, it's a completely uncontroversial thesis that the opinions of others have epistemic force only to the extent that they are independent of one another. Um, but the problem with this diagnosis of echo chambers is, is first with this kind of way of thinking about, you um, our relationship to other people in our community and our relationship to the other beliefs that they have. So um, dependence, uh, you know, I, I, I wanna argue and I have argued in other work that it's not nearly as epistemically devastating as it's often suggested to be. So I just, I, I obviously very much disagree with Alga that this is a completely uncontroversial thesis. Here's a plausible online version of Wittgenstein's newspaper scenario. Suppose that every member of a 200 person group on social media posts a comment explaining why Brexit is a mistake. Each of them is simply repeating what they learned from the same exact online news source, let's just say the Guardian. So in such a case, the standard view of echo chamber says that the number of voices commenting on Brexit being a mistake just reduces to a single source. 
But I, I want to say that there is an important kind of dependence that people, I think, often, most of the time, uh, exhibit, and, and it's what I call autonomous dependence. So autonomous dependence involves the subject exercising epistemic agency in her reliance on a source of information, which in turn involves, and this is very minimal, I don't expect this to be um, characterizing all dimensions of epistemic agency, monitoring the incoming testimony for counter evidence, possessing beliefs about the reliability and trustworthiness of the testimonial source, either in particular or in general, and bearing responsibility for expressing the view in question. So if we go back to the Brexit case, we see that if 200 users post about Brexit because of what they autonomously learned in The Guardian, then the epistemic support for the claim in question goes far beyond that of the author of the original article itself. Recall that that dependence thesis says that all 200, the epistemic support we get from all 200 of those people just reduces to the author of that Guardian article. But such a view was filtered through 200 different epistemic frameworks, which brings along potential differences in counter evidence conditions, reliability assessments, meaning their assessment of the reliability of sources, and they're taking up the belief in the first place, which brings with it a certain kind of responsibility. So it doesn't reduce to just the responsibility of the original Guardian author, but there is also some responsibility that we bear for taking up beliefs. Now, someone might argue that people in echo chambers are simply not examples of autonomous dependence. They might appeal to something like Alvin Goldman's notion of non-independence. So his notion is of non-independence says that Y is just as likely to follow X's opinion, whether H is true or false. So in these sorts of cases, Y is a non-discriminating reflector of X with respect to a particular question. And when someone is a non-discriminating reflector in this way, that person's opinion has no extra evidence evidential worth for the agent above and beyond the original source's opinion. So the upshot for Goldman is that if two or more opinion holders are totally non-independent of one another, and if the subject knows or is justified in believing this, then the subject's opinion should not be swayed even a little by more than one of these opinion holders. So on this view, what's problematic with much of our online discourse where people are slipping into echo chambers is that we're just non-discriminating reflectors of one another, right? We're just essentially, you know, kind of parroting what other people are saying. Um, so, you know, when we have 200 people, you know, kind of saying something that they learned in The Guardian, then it really does just reduce to that original source because they're just non-discriminating reflectors. Um, the problem with this is that very few of us as consumers of information literally form beliefs non-independently. So consider what this would amount to. We would pick someone for, you know, to, uh, you know with whom we're just going to, you know, non-discriminately reflect. And we would be just as likely to accept what we are told when it is reported that cockatiels are mammals rather than birds, that onion rings are healthier than broccoli, that the earth is under rather than over 100 years old, and so on. So even if Democrats are very likely to accept what CNN reports and Republicans are disposed to believe Fox, surely there are epistemic limits for most of us. So I think that Goldman's notion of non-independence <clears throat> requires that the trust in our sources be entirely blind in order for there to be a complete absence of additional epistemic support. But there's another problem that I'm just going to briefly mention, and that's that Goldman's account of non-independence is characterized in terms of being a non-discriminating reflector with respect to a particular question. But even if that person is not a discriminating reflector of that question, why may that person may nonetheless be discriminating when it comes to the kind of source that they are relying on? And here's a question that I think it's 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 sort of surprising that I just never see anyone ask this question. I mean, maybe there's literature out there. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just one person and I can't follow all the literature out there. But I certainly have not seen a lot of discussions on the question of how did the person get into the echo chamber in question? So we can imagine, let me see what the next slide, yeah, sorry, I thought that the next slide might get into this. Um, so, you know, we, you know, imagine that someone kind of spends a lot of time deciding on their source on um, climate, you know, kind of change, and they decide to rely on, um, on an academic journal, the best academic journal on climate change. And so they're just going to be a non-discriminating reflector with respect to everything that they learn in that journal about climate change versus someone who flips a coin and goes online and says, I'm going to be a non-discriminating reflector of everything that person says with respect to climate change. Um, it's an incredibly important question that we ask, how did these respective people get into the echo chambers in question? Um, a lot 
of these philosophers, you know, Goldman and the views and disagreement want to diagnose all of this as a structural question, right? It's just like your behavior is problematic because you're a non-discriminating reflector. But there's a prior question, you know, kind of what, what kind of epistemic agent are you in the world, right? And how do you find yourself in those contexts? And what did you do to get into that context in which you're going to be such a non-discriminating reflector? So, um, Another um, kind of problem that sometimes is, di is said that um, exists with respect to echo chambers is that they just a lack of diverse viewpoints. And Cass Sunstein is really well known for this. So in a well-functioning democracy, people don't live in echo chambers or information cocoons. Um, and there are lots of arguments that have been given. I'm just going to kind of gloss over in the interest of time about why diversity might matter epistemically and why diversity, you know, um, might matter for the truth. And so John Stuart Mill has at least four arguments concerning free speech and truth that I think we could appeal to. Dewey has some arguments. I'm just not going to go into those those right now, just because um, that's that's I think would take us too far afield. Um, but we can certainly discuss some of that in the Q and A. Um, but the problem with this diagnosis as well of echo chambers is that restricting information sources is not objectionable by itself. In fact, it can even have some clear epistemic benefits. So it can block out noise, it can streamline the consumption of news and increase the likelihood of acquiring true and avoiding false beliefs. And so if sources are added simply to avoid worries about insulation and the illegitimate reinforcement of beliefs without any regard for their reliability, the result can end up far worse epistemically. So you can imagine, you know, the scenario we were talking about before, if I learn about climate change from a reputable environmental scientist, there's only the danger of making my situation worse off by also consulting with a climate change denier. Um, another problem with this is that I think it lends itself to a what we're all in the same boat kind of attitude about the consumption of information. And I've seen this move made a lot. Um, so, you know, people will say like, oh, well, you know, this political group, they're listening only to Fox News. And then the response is, well, you know, kind of the other political side is listening only to, you know, CNN or something. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, we, you know, and, and even taking, I think, like a starker contrast, right, would be something like you're only getting your information about climate change from the Journal of Applied Meteorology and Climatology. So you and all those academics are in an echo chamber. Um, and, you know, you're criticizing us for just getting our, our information about climate change from Fox News. Again, this just kind of re reinforces this. We're all in the same boat here. We're all just in our own little echo chambers um, because of a lack of exposure to op opposing or diverse viewpoints. But obviously, we want to say that there's something importantly epistemically different between the person who is in an echo chamber with um, other, you know, kind of scientists um, who are publishing in the Journal of Applied Meteorology and Climatology and the other ones. Um, and I think a third problem is that I think it might kind of pr promote some simple solutions to deep social crises. Um, and that might be, you know, kind of just the addition of opposing viewpoints. So Sunstein suggests, you know, kind of having an, a, this opposing viewpoint kind of um, button on social media. Um, and I think that um, when we think that it's just diversity, um, we don't really kind of, it allows us in some respects to not ask some of the like really difficult questions at, at the kind of what I might call like the ground level, right? Um, you know, kind of what kind of diversity? When should diversity be relevant? Are there some contexts in which diversity are bad and some are good? And all of this, I think, is actually like genuine work for applied epistemology. Um, and so, you know, the, well, anyway, I'm kind of getting ahead of, my, of myself. So I think that there's a similarity in responses here. Both understand the epistemic problem with an echo chamber as structural in nature. So echo chambers themselves are completely content neutral. We don't ask any, like what I was calling earlier, like on the ground questions, like who's in the echo chamber? How did they get there? What kinds of content are they just, you know, kind of echoing from one another and so on. And I think structural problems lend themselves to principled solutions that can float freely of actual conversations. Um, you know, these actual conversations, some of which I've hinted at, you know, about, um, you know, like, how, like I said, how people got there and, and what they're and what they're discussing. So I think that there's a structure versus content issue here. Fake news um, is, is a more kind of content driven sort of concern that we might have. And so um, just 
For instance, pundit facts scorecard for the truth of statements made on air by Fox News and their pundit guests, only 10% are true. So let's just return back to one of my worries about echo chambers, right? And this being the accusation that we're launching against one another. So let's like think about like kind of political disagreement, right? Like, oh, you know, kind of Trump and his supporters, they're all in an echo chamber. Let's just go home. That's like the end of our epistemic criticism, right? And then they come back and they say, well, you guys are all too. You're not watching Fox News, right? So we're all in the same boat. The problem needs to get to, I mean, the way that we need to kind of resolve this impasse is by looking at the actual empirically informed um, facts about epistemology um, to start kind of driving a wedge between this, we're all in the same boat sort of, of, of response to this structural analysis of what's problematic. So when we have kind of facts like this, right, that Fox News and their pundit guests, um, you know, kind of only report the truth 10% of the time. Um, this is a fact that drives a wedge between the we're all in the same boat um, response. The main source for 40% of Trump vote voters during the 2016 elect election was Fox News. Um, and Fox, Fox News, um, nearly half of consistent conservatives, 47%, name it as their main source for government and political news. So putting this all together, the main source of news for Trump supporters and conservatives is also said to have pundit guests who speak the truth only 10% of the time. So another thing that is um, really relevant is that um, falsehoods have far greater power and reach than the truth does online. And this is another um, instance in which I would say, um, you know, empirically informed, you know, what, what we might say, empirically informed applied epistemology is absolutely, cru cru you know, kind of crucial to look at when we're talking about the epistemology of testimony. Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't kind of think about like cooperative conversations a la Grice, but I'm suggesting that like when we're generating normative principles about how we ought to interact with people in conversations, we have to look at some of this, um, kind of some of the data on the ground. So there was a 2018 study that found that rumor cascades, which are unbroken, uh, well, there was a 2018 study about rumor cascades, which are unbroken retweet chains with a single common origin. The data set included 126,000 rumor cascades spread by over 3 million people more than 4.6 million times between 2006 and 2017. The results were that falsehoods diffused significantly farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth in all cate categories of information. False news, news cascades reached between 1,000 and 100,000 people, while the true ones rarely extended beyond 1,000 people. It took the truth about six times longer to reach 1,500 people than falsehoods did. And these differences between true and false rumor cascades were especially pronounced when it comes to political news. False political news reached more than 20,000 people nearly three times faster than all other types of news reached 10,000 people. Now, we might think that there is a structural um, analysis that can be given here, right? Perhaps those who spread falsity followed more people, had more followers, tweeted more often, were more often verified users, or had been on Twitter longer. But the study, when you know, kind of this is the authors of the study, when we compared users involved in true and false rumor cascades, we found that the opposite was true in every case. Users who spread who spread false news had significantly fewer followers, followed significantly fewer people, were significantly less active on Twitter, were verified significantly less often, and had been on Twitter for significantly less time. Falsehood diffused farther and faster than the truth, despite these differences, not because of them. So a structural explanation seemed like something that might not kind of might be, you know, kind of particularly salient here, but the, the data just didn't bear it out. Um, so false rumor cascades are more powerful than the true, um, the true ones because of the way in which, so, so false rumor cascades, it's not more powerful than the true ones because of the way in which the information is dispersed, but rather it seems, and again, you know, this is a fairly recent study, but it seemed to the authors that the central driving force was content. 
So false rumors were uh, you know, significantly more novel than true ones across all of the relevant novelty metrics, such as displaying much higher information uniqueness. And they were suggesting that because of this novelty, it inspired different kinds of response from users. For instance, greater response from users of surprise or disgust. So um, I think that what we see here is that while echo chambers by themselves are not epistemically problematic, and so we can't give this purely structural analysis, um, what echo chambers filled with fake news are problematic. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. I mean, I'll just tell you what it is. I think that... Um, you know, Bernard Williams has this really interesting, um, you know, kind of quote about um, that, you know, we might kind of think that the internet is, um, you know, kind of changing things in a qualitative way. Um, but in fact, really, we've just always had people who are liars. We've always had people who are spreading gossip and rumors. We've always, you know, kind of had people in our community who are um, deceiving us in various sorts of ways. And so really, you know, kind of the, um, the internet and all of our online interaction and access is, is not a game changer. It's really just a problem of quantity. There's just more of it, right? I mean, we have our iPhones, we have um, Facebook, we have Twitter, we have Snapchat and TikTok and whatever. And so um, this has not changed things. I mean, we used to just go to like the local pub or something and get all of our gossip and rumors. Uh, we just get it through a different sort of, you know, format, so to speak. Um, and so we're just exposed to, to more of it. Um, but I think that, um, I think that there are two things that I want to kind of um, highlight um, through our the, the kind of the next sort of part of the discussion, which is I'm going to turn to um, bots and um, I think some unique challenges that bots pose um, when we're thinking through these issues. Um, and again, I think that this is re really um, is a powerful instance of why non-ideal epistemology of testimony is so important. So two things I want to highlight. First, um, I think that bots um, provide a really interestingly um, unique sort of epistemic problem. And in this way, I think that it's, it's, it shows that I think what Bernard Williams was saying is, is probably incorrect, that it's not just a matter of quantity. It's not just that we're inundated with more of it, but that there's actually a change, like a change in, 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 in the actual context. So I think it is what we might call a game changer. Um, and the second thing that I think focusing on bots does for our discussion is um, I think that the earlier um, defense I provided for thinking that echo chambers are not that problematic um, is, is called, in, it, it's challenged in various ways by the existence of bots. So recall that one of the things that um, made the, that, that um, led me to suggest that um, echo chambers are not nearly as problematic as, as people suggest that they are, is that, you know, kind of most of us are autonomous, um, you know, users. We're, uh, we, we exhibit a kind of autonomous dependence so that we're not non-discriminating reflectors, you know, a la Goldman. Um, you know, we're not merely parrots so that, you know, kind of, you know, whatever you say, I just mirror back. Um, I might trust you when you say P, P, Q, and R, and then when you say something that is sort of kind of strange or bizarre, um, I might kind of then say like, well, no, I'm going to actually go with my own views on this, even if um, I have highlighted, you know, kind of um, identified you as, as an expert or an authority on a particular question. Um, but when the members in the community are not exercising the relevant kind of autonomy, indeed, when they are simply such that they cannot take on views with autonomy, then I think that we have um, a, a, a different kind of problem. So a 2017 Pew Research Center study show, found that 66% of all tweeted links to popular news and current event websites come from social media bots, which are automated accounts capable of posting content or interacting with other users with no direct human involvement. So the percentage of tweeted links from bots is even higher among certain kinds of news sites. So 89% of tweeted links to popular aggregation sites that compile stories from around the web are posted by bots. That's a picture of a bot, you know, kind of posting these links. 
Um, so this study, this 2017 study, found that a relatively small number of highly active bots are responsible for a significant percentage of the links to prominent news and media sites. So the 500 most active bot accounts are responsible for 22% of the tweeted links to popular news and current events sites. In contrast, the 500 most active human users are responsible for an estimated 6% of tweeted links to these outlets. <clears throat> so um, again, just recall our earlier discussion about autonomy um, and it's you know, kind of how crucial of a role it plays in, um, in thinking through online interaction in thinking through the epistemic status of dependence and in thinking through um, you know, deference and trust and all sorts of issues that I think are really, really relevant to the epistemology of testimony and to our um, dependence on other you know, uh, one another in the community. But bots don't exercise autonomy. They don't have sets of beliefs that are filtering content. Again, recall that one of the reasons why even when People are, um, you know, um, you know, kind of when all of, you know, kind of 200 people who believe a particular claim all got that claim, you know, depended on the guardian for that claim. Um, they're filtering that content through their dogsastic systems. I mean, think about just how every single one of us on this, at, you know, on this, this Zoom call um, has a radically different kind of set of, of beliefs, right? And when a belief makes it in, it's been filtered through, you know, kind of all of those different dogsastic sets. Um, and that filtering content gives it additional support so that even 200 people, you know, kind of 200 people is different than one person believing it, even if there is dependence. But bots don't do that, right? They're not filtering content in that sort of way. Um, they can't be regarded as irrational for having beliefs in the face of counter evidence. So we can't, you know, kind of use like kind of norms in the community um, to, uh, you know, to assess them in, in various ways. They don't assess the reliability of sources <clears throat> and they don't bear responsibility for their assertions. Uh, so these were all some of the ways in which um, um, aut autonomous dependence was said to, um, allow echo chambers to have, you know, kind of believers or community members or users who, um, who have beliefs with, you know, epistemic justification and with additional epistemic justification, even independently of their original source. So one of the problems with echo chambers and bots is that bots are amplifying voices that are not really voices at all. So again, you know, just the contrast, I'm not, you know, I don't mean to be repetitive here, but just to kind of bring out the contrast, right? I mean, when 200 users relied on The Guardian, um, I'm suggesting that like, in, in, you know, in contrast to what people like Kelly and Elga say, and even Goldman, um, it's not that it reduces to one. There are 200 real voices there, and they exercised autonomous dependence. But bots amplify voices that are not really voices at all. So when we see 200 users, it's not 200 voices when bots are involved. Um, and, uh, you know, the expressed views do not reflect beliefs because there aren't believers, right? I mean, not at least in the, in the traditional sense. And echo chambers become seriously problematic when there are news approvers, you know, people who appear to be approving like, claims, who appear to be posting with autonomy, but in fact are not even human. And so in this sense, I think we see a way in which, you know, as I said, like, you know, Williams arguing, Bernard Williams arguing that um, the internet really just is not a game changer, right? It's just like kind of taking the pub, you know, the local pub um, to the, to, to an online format and increasing access. I think that when we look at the prevalence of bots, we realize that, that actually there are a number of game changing factors uh, that come about with our online interaction. So there's not only fake news that raises epistemic pitfalls for us online, but there's also fake news approvers, right? There are these, you know, kind of, um, you know, in, so obviously we think that like, you know, kind of when we're in a community and, you know, like five respected colleagues believe that P, that person is, we, let's just call that person a news approver, right? It's someone who's approving the claim that P, 
And that's raising its epistemic status for us, right? Like we've here, we've got five members of our community who believe that P, they're news approvers, they're like our proposition approvers, right? In that sense. And so that raises the status for us. Um, but when we're in our online interaction, bots present this problem that it's not just that we're kind of have all of these pitfalls of fake news, but also that there are fake news approvers, right? There are, um, you know, there is the, the appearance of, you know, 200, um, you know, uh, people agreeing with a claim in The Guardian. Um, but in fact, it really does only um, amount to a single, a single um, approval. Okay, so um, I have just a couple of minutes. So good way. I mean, I think I, I got, you know, I think this is going to, I think I'm going to end on time. Um, so I want to just return to ideal epistemology of testimony and um, just re recall, um, you know, the earlier claims um, about the norms of trustworthiness and trusting that are taken to describe our conversational practices. So we should walk into a, 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 a testimonial exchange, assuming that um, the speaker is trustworthy. And we should bring to bear in that conversation the norm of trustworthiness, right? That's what should be operative. We should be just generally trustworthy. And all those kinds of messy conditions are relegated to just defeating conditions. Such views ignore the prevalence of fake news, um, which is a very serious problem. Um, it ignores the power of falsity. And it ignores the role that non-autonomous bots play in our exchanges, our testimonial exchanges. Um, many of our um, much interaction, particularly for gener you know, kind of for younger generations. I, I don't, I don't know how old everyone is on this call, but I mean, I, I have a, you know, t a teenager and a young adult, and and certainly, um, you know, kind of much more of their life. I mean, well, when I was their age, I just, I didn't have an online life. And now much more of their interaction is online um, than, than would have even been, you know, kind of um, a thought in my head, um, even let's, let's, let's say 10 years ago. So when we're thinking about the epistemology of testimony, kind of continuing to generate these norms of trust and trustworthiness while the landscape on the ground is radically changing and the nature of conversations is changing and the nature of communication is changing. Um, I think it's to threaten to make the epistemology of testimony irrelevant. Uh, so now what? Um, so, uh, you know, unfortunately, this talk was more critical than positive. Um, I think that um, what we need to do, I mean, as, as first of all, I think we need to do a lot more empirically informed epistemology of testimony. So I think that rather than only thinking about how to generate norms um, through philosophical theories, we need to look at, you know, kind of the role that falsity plays in online interaction, um, the role that um, bots are playing, how many bots there are, where they are, and so on. I think that we need to do empirically informed epistemology of testimony. I think we also need to do more applied epistemology. I think we need to look at what um, echo chambers are, what the problems are, when they're good, when they're bad, um, and ask, you know, kind of bring a normativity to a lot of discussions that remain, at least in a lot of disciplines, just purely descriptive. So I think that there is actually really important work that um, epistemologists of testimony can de do here. Um, but I think that um, much of the work that um, epistemologists of testimony have been doing sh should shift. I'm not saying all of it, but, but I think some, much of it should shift to asking a lot more um, applied questions. Um, and, you know, kind of thinking back to um, some of Mill's criticisms about what ideal epistemology leaves out. You know, we, I think that we have a clear sense from this uh, talk about how the epistemologists of testimony um, have idealized capacities and idealized institutions. But one question that is relevant here, and I think that there's a whole bunch of cases, I, a lot of my, my current research is uh, also working on questions at the intersection of social epistemology and the criminal law. And I think that there, there are all sorts of ways in which um, discussions are hyper idealized and ignore that question that Mills talks about, which is silence on oppression. Um, but I think that in this context too, um, there are a whole, whole host of questions um, that are really important to ask with respect to testimonial exchanges. Uh, I mean, one study that I think I just saw from 2021 was asking some really important questions about why most bots are gendered feminine or gendered female. Um, and what that means for our beliefs about 
women in online exchanges and, um, you know, kind of how that, what role that plays in terms of regarding, you know, kind of beliefs about trustworthiness and not trust being not trustworthy. Um, there are also, um, you know, lots of studies that talk about um, kind of like a lot of online harassment that uh, members of marginalized communities face. How does that how does that um, interact with questions about um, online interaction and trust and trustworthiness and you know kind of a lot of these questions that we started off with at the start of the talk. Um, and then I think that um, more work needs to be done. I mean, I'll, you know, there has been a fair bit of work, but done on epistemic vigilance and, um, you know, kind of, you know, there's been a lot of work done on trust and trustworthiness and that's valuable work and good work. Um, but I think that, you know, if, you know, kind of some of the issues that I've drawn attention to and many others um, are in fact game changers in the way that I'm suggesting, um, then much more work needs to be done, not so much on talking about how we need to have this constant default position of trust, but, you know, kind of how to cultivate practices of epistemic vigilance that don't, you know, kind of fall, slip us into the side of skepticism or doubt, um, but, you know, kind of protect um, communities, particularly vulnerable members of community, um, you know, epistemically. Um, so I think I've ended, yeah, just two minutes over. So thanks. I think that's it. Thanks. Uh, thanks to Jennifer uh, for uh, ideally timed talks.